Good morning again. Thank you for your patience this morning. I hope you've all had a good opportunity to interact a little um, in our Congress breakout area, which seems to get bigger and better each year. So thanks to those that have brought things along to show other Congress delegates. We appreciate your support. And I know it makes it a much more valuable and worthwhile experience coming to Congress um, if you're able to have that interaction and learn more about what your colleagues are up to. So um, I have the pleasure of uh, reporting today on behalf of the board in relation to the nine goals that were set out in the Netball 2020 strategic plan. So I'm going to begin with a little bit of an update on the Secretariat. I think it's really lovely when you're all with us um, and the fact that you're actually in the UK where the, the Secretariat is based that you'll actually be able to meet all the people that you deal with uh, by email and by telephone during the course of the year. So then I will go through progress on delivering with the strategic plan. And I thought uh, Netball 2020, we're nearly at the end of that plan now. So I thought we ought to give you a bit of a flavor of where we've come year by year. So uh, hopefully it will give you a feeling that we are making progress Sometimes things feel very slow, but, uh, but it's quite nice to reflect sometimes and then to talk a little bit about where we're looking for in the future. So first of all, um, these are the um, full-time permanent staff based in the Secretariat in Manchester. Um, and I'm going to get them to stand up and wave to you, embarrassingly so. So is Maggie in the room, please? Oh. Maggie must be very busy working on our, our behalf. So um, most of you have met Maggie before, but please do introduce you, uh, to, uh, yourselves to her. So she's our administration manager based in Manchester, and she's usually the first port of call when uh, an email comes in to inf at netball.org. Um, she's that first person. She may not have an answer, but hopefully she knows a man or woman that does so we try and uh, use use that as our as our main email address and uh, she's normally the first person to pick up the telephone as well so is she there no okay and uh, Angela Sanderson is here so Angela Angela is our financial accountant has been with us for a few years now and um, a lot of what you see in the papers with the accounts obviously that's the work that she does in the office she is our gov governance guru so she keeps us on our toes um, she collects in all the monies and pay makes all the payments with us but is a great uh, a great support to me in terms of all of the governing with integrity um, a strategic part of the strategic plan so thank you Angela Now, I'm not sure whether Christina is still with us. So Christina we're in, um, is our international umpiring manager who's appointed. Uh, she was first appointed in 2015. So this will be her second World Cup. Um, she's actually at all the competition meetings this morning on our behalf. So um, we'll just have to say thank you to Christina in her absence. So I'll give her a round of applause. Um, and then we have a new member of staff that's just joined us at the end of May, and that's Grace Watson. I think, Grace, if you'd like to stand up and give a wave. So Grace has been doing some really exciting work since she joined us as our digital marketing officer. Um, and you're going to see a lot of her work over the next few days. So um, please make sure you say hello to her, and she's a great addition to the team. So those are our permanent full-time staff, but we also have other people who, who work with us very closely. So our extended team. So we have an intern called Becca Nicholson. Is Be Becca there? Thank you, Becca. So, so Becca has been with us since just after the Commonwealth Games last year, and she's a university student here in Manchester on an events management degree. And so she has been, um, actually, if you look around the room, this is her handiwork, working with our presentation partners. So she's done a fantastic job, and you'll see much more of her work over the next couple of days. But she'll be leaving us, I'm afraid, in August, because she's got another year of university to go. And uh, Zoe, is Zoe here? Zoe will be joining us in August, but she's come along today and tomorrow just to meet a few people. 
So we've been really pleased to be able to offer an empowerment opportunity in our own office um, each year to have a, a student come in or a recent graduate to come and work with us and learn about how an international federation works. I have to say they, worked, they work very hard. They're not just making the tea at all. So uh, I, do, I do love having the interns in and um, we've, we're on, we'll be on our fourth by the time Zoe comes in. So it's been a really good experience. And if any of you are able to do that for students, it's a marvelous opportunity for them as well. So where's Joan? Is Joan there? Joan. So we all know Joan. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. So you know that Joan is, is, is based in Africa as our regional development manager, based in Namibia, and uh, she works with all our African members to, on all sorts of things, whether it's governance, whether it's visas, coming to events, and she's an essential member of our team. So thank you, Joan, for all your hard work. Thank you. And Nikki, Nikki Richardson, who is at the back of the room. I think most of you know Nikki. So Nikki was on the full-time staff, but now she's, she's now got her own consultancy. So she's working with us on a few projects over this weekend, this week that you're going to see. And I'm really pleased to have Nikki back here working with us. So you will, you will still hear and, and see Nikki working with us, and she's a great support to our team. But I would like to really thank her for all the hard work she did when she was a member of our staff. Particularly, I mean, the Commonwealth Games was... Uh, our coverage um, in terms of an international federation, our work with Peace Prescovia, um, that was all down to Nikki. And I'd just like to say a special thank you for myself for all the hard work you did when you were on the staff. And I'm so glad we can still call upon your expertise. Thank you, Nikki. So, um, in your packs is our Netball, Net, Netball 2020 strategic plan. For those of you that have been at Congress um, in, in uh, uh, Botswana, we went through that in detail. So I'm not going to do that today, um, but I'm just going to draw your attention uh, to um, the fact that there is a vision there. We have a mission, and this is the plan that we're working, working towards um, in the period from 2016 to 2020. We work in four-year cycles in sport, and... Um, and I hope you can see evidence of all of, our, all of the aspects of our strategic plan. Um, we, we really do try and live those values. We really do aspire to excellence. We believe in fairness and integrity. And most of all, we believe in friendship. And really, we have been so delighted with the warm welcome we've had from Liverpool I know you're going to have a really lovely time here. Um, the welcome event last night um, was absolutely fabulous. So if there are any representatives from the city of Liverpool, thank you very much for that. And let's try and all live up to all these values, excellence, fairness and integrity, and friendship during the course of the Congress. Um, we all want you to have a lovely time when you're here. I know the, the volunteers, um, in addition to my team, are all the team in the, in the purple shirts. And we've, we've been very lucky to be assigned some extra volunteers. So please, if you need anything, do ask the team and, um, and let's all walk away feeling that we've really lived those values during the course of the, of the next few days. So onto the, um, onto the actual, uh, our three core strategies, which we do go on about rather a lot, but it, does, it is helpful to kind of know what you're doing. Um, so I'm going to be reporting on those three areas. So, governing with integrity. Um, so, our first goal in governing with integrity is actually about how we act as a governing body and how we are seen and being a benchmark in our sport. So, but we benchmark ourselves against all the other international federations. And so, um, you're going to be seeing some evidence today of some external benchmarking. Um, this is a really important for us. We learn from our interaction with the other international federations. And we benchmark ourselves against the best in the world. The, um, actually, we are the best in the world. No, I can't say that. We, we, we look at the Olympic sports. We look at the non-Olympic sports. We have recognized sports. So where you see, there's a lot of um, acronyms in international sport. IF means International Federation, but where you look at IOC, I think most people know what the IOC is, but the summer sports to get, get together, their grouping are the ASOIF, 
and often they're held up as the, the benchmarks. So, so we use the same organisations to scrutinise our governance as the Summer Olympic sports. And that's the government, governance benchmarking. We did a self-assessment in year one. We then got um, I Trust Sport to come in and assess our own governance. And so you've, you've got the guy that did that, basically coming to talk this afternoon. Um, so what we've been doing during 2018 is actually implementing a lot of the recommendations that came out in that benchmarking study. And then this year, um, what's happened is that beyond the Olympic federations, the summer and winter Olympic federations, the whole grouping of sports called GAFES, that's, um, that basically means every, every international federation out there, whether it's, um, it's hockey, field hockey, right the way through to chess, where all of this grouping, they're, they're GAFES, that means all the international federations, and there are over 100 sports in that. Um, they did a benchmarking study looking at the rest of the, um, the, rest of the sports beyond the Olympic sports. And um, so we've been a part of that study this year. And uh, you're, I'm not going to steal um, Roland Jack's thunder, but he's going to tell you about that. So we've been on a governance journey, and hopefully you've seen some differences. It's very basic stuff like um, making sure that we are... Um, very open about the operations that um, that we actually publish all of our all of our congress papers on our website so they're publicly accessible so transparency is one measure of showing whether your governance is good and we i would really urge you to think about that in your own federations so the other thing so in order to actually make those governance changes happen is that we had a, a governance working group established early on and um, that governance working group worked with the board to create a governance policy which was approved by the board and that again it's all visible on our website and that's the governance framework that we work with it's our committee structures it's how the board operates it's delegation of, of responsibilities who can decide what so that's all published now and then what we did in 2018 in the last year was to review all those committees and see whether they were fit for purpose and uh, really look at all their terms of reference so there's been a lot of work done in that area, and um, and then um, um, and that's been and that's continuing on. So now, if I show you um, how we look at our governance structure, so we have all our members as as our Congress, and the Congress has the ultimate power in the, in terms. This is a membership body, and you need to understand that this is where the this is this is what it's all about. There's nothing without we are nothing without our members. And you delegate certain powers to the INF board, and that's the, the ladies to my left. And then the board has various committees. And so there's been a fair amount of change, but this is our current structure. So we have an audit and risk committee. We have a commercial committee, and that was fairly newly established. Um, governance is no longer a working group. It's now a, a formal committee of the board. We have a sustainability and development working group, and you're going to be seeing some of their output over the next few days. That's basically um, looking at where we were establishing our foundation. And we had um, a bid evaluation committee, which was set up to a separate committee to evaluate the bids for the Netball World Cup. So those are our committees and working groups. And then there's a few more, because we also then, we have the INF Secretariat, which is the team I introduced you to earlier, um, I lead that team, and, and then the technical panels um, report into us. So we have a coaching advisory panel, and during the year you'll see we reappointed those. So all the individuals on the coaching advisory panel you can see on our website are there. We have our rules advisory panel, which again was reappointed, and they'll be meeting later this year to look at uh, any, any rules changes. And we also reappointed our medical committee. Um, so there's been a lot of change there. And if you ever want to know anything about the governance structure, it's all there on the website with very clear terms of references for all of those panels. I'd just like to thank the governance committee for really for all the work they've done there. It's been brilliant. So, um, and all the slides from Congress, we'll put, put all these up on the website. So really don't worry about taking detailed notes. Very good. Right, so... That's the first goal. So that's what we've been doing over the past four years. 
Um, second goal is also within governing with integrity, and that's all about you and us. Having engaged and, pr and proactive members and regional federations. So one of the measures for me of how proactive our membership is, is the number of people at Congress. So I probably did this slide yesterday. I believe we have in the room 45, or will have and then over the course of the day, 45 full and five associate members. So I'd like a round of applause to you all because this is our biggest ever Congress. And it does, it really gives me a great thrill to see so many netballers in the room. I think it's testaments to the strength of the sport and your commitment to come all this way. Some of you have come some very long distances, so we really do appreciate it. It, it makes what we do in that office and all those emails really worthwhile, so thank you. So the other things that we've done in terms of um, working with membership is we've, we've had a great focus over the years on safeguarding um, and we've won various workshops and we did a workshop um, in Africa in 2016, thanks to support from um, UK Sport. So when we came to um, the Botswana Congress, we thought, gee, I wonder if we can extend the sorts of workshops we're doing. And we put on our first sort of workshop program. And uh, I, it, was, it was a bit of a pilot, really, to see how it worked. And because obviously it was, it was a smaller Congress, but we had a terrific response from uh, the members that were there, great support. And so, and when we surveyed uh, those that attended the Congress uh, workshops in Botswana, they said they found them really useful because we're very aware that on a day like this, we're talking to you, but uh, you don't get much of a chance to engage. So the difference for us was about how we could engage with all of you and really hear your views in those face-to-face -face discussions. So, um, so we thought, well, we should probably do this again. Um, so, of course, we have, we have a huge programme now, um, which is a part of Make the Game Liverpool programme um, at the Netball World Cup. So, we've had a terrific response to those. I think we've had something like 400 individual delegates for something like nine sessions. And those are just our workshops. And they fall part of um, England Netball every time, every year, have a Make the Game Live um, Congress uh, uh, program or development program and we decided to brand the whole thing make the game Liverpool and fall under that so within that program we've got the Congress workshops we've got the observer program which is run by UK sport and we've got all the England netball programs so there's a huge educational program um, and it's uh, I hope you really enjoy it and we'll talk to you a little bit more about those tomorrow just um, if you've not signed up yet we can squeeze a few few more in um, so, and just one more comment on here on governing with integrity. We did a huge effort to collect all the constitutional documents from the members and we, it was quite painful, but thank you. We've got, I think, most of the members' constitutional documents now. And so in the workshop, we'll be working with those to help you identify. So we've actually, in the governance workshop, worked out the agenda based on the areas where we thought we needed to um, work with you on your constitutional documents. So it's been a really, really good exercise. That was done with, by one of our interns with um, our governance guru over here, Angela. So that's great. So that's governing with integrity too. Now the third part of governing, governing with integrity is about ensuring that netball remains a drug-free sport. And this is a really important commitment when we survey our stakeholders, we, people believe we have a, a clean sport. We know we have a clean sport. We're in the public eye. It is so critical that the, we remain that way. We have had zero anti-doping rules violations. That's what ADRV stands for. Over the period so far, I want it to stay that way. So the most important thing we can do is provide education to our to our participants to ensure they understand their responsibilities. And I really urge you to come along to the governance workshop around this and make sure you understand your responsibilities. We, it could take one bad result and, and our reputation will go. So let's maintain our reputation as a clean, well-managed sport where we believe governance is at the heart of it. And um, that is a huge value to us, a huge value. And we're respected outside of netball for that. So uh, we're all in this. Thank you. So 
On to our next one. So oh, that's, that, that's, the, that's the lecture done. On to the thrilling world-class events. Um, we've had a few events over the years. Thank you very much to um, Netball Australia for hosting three fantastic Fast Five Netball World Series in Melbourne. They, they were absolutely brilliant. Um, we also, um, we also obviously, in the period we had the, um, oh, I'm missing a logo there. I do apologize, Netball World Youth Cup. We, we had the most amazing time in Botswana. And one of, it does get a bit of a mention through, throughout the course of our uh, event. Um, we had uh, a real first, which was live streaming there. And that was a real commitment to actually try and grow audiences for us. We obviously, we have the Vitality Netball World Cup here in Liverpool. And uh, we have a very exciting app, which is about to go live. It's with the App Store right now, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, Grace will be able to tell you all about that on the uh, workshop over there, in the uh, Congress delegate area over there. Um, but one of the key things we did as an international federation was to um, become a partner with Lagardère Sports and Entertainment. They were appointed to sell our international broadcast rights for the Netball World Cup for 2019 and for 2023 and that's um, been a very good experience for us um, they're a very professional outfit and they are helping to create value for the federation and you'll hear why we need we, why we need additional income from our finance director shortly so secondly on thrilling world-class events oh there you go there's the netball world youth cup logo i knew it would come in there somewhere um we've had two uh I hope you would say successful bid processes through the period. Um, in 2017, we selected Fiji as the host of the Netball World Youth Cup, and you're going to hear from them this morning, for 2021. And in 2019, uh, South Africa were selected as hosts of the Netball World Cup 2023. So we run those bidding processes. We hope you think they are fair and transparent. If ever you want to see any of the documentation, we always involve the membership in, although the, the board make the final decision, the bid evaluation um, committee um, have, have a balance of independence on, on that bid evaluation committee. They make a recommendation to the board and then the board makes the final decision. But, very importantly, but, we actually get the views of the membership on the bids beforehand, and those and that view is really important. So I'd really like to thank those of you that fed back on the bids on the bid documents that you were shown for Netball World Cup 2023. That's a really important part of the process. Um, the, the sixth goal is also in thrilling world-class events, and that's world-class standards in officiating for international events. So this is Christina's area, so I hope I do this justice with her not being here. So um, Christina was appointed in 2015, so really this is all the work that she's been doing since then. Um, you've seen evidence of some of her work. Um, she, during, she was appointed after an initial Wharton benchmarking survey, but there was a follow-up survey done in 2017. Um, from the officiating community and that asked all the membership and those in the offici officiating community how would you just how would you describe world class and they came up with 70 indicators of world class grouped into different areas and so what we are doing now is we are monitoring our performance we are addressing those 70 areas on a journey to world class now like any moving object those we know that that will get that if we make progress, probably the description for world class will move on again. So expect to see some more research in the future. But we are absolutely working on that journey. Um, we also decided that we thought it was important to have a, vis a vision for world class. Our officiating community are a really important part of the of of netball, and they have a very hard time sometimes and we felt that they needed more to, more to be able to um, draw them together and show the strength of that group so Christina has been working extremely hard on the vision for officiating and the vision for world class and if you look in the congress delicate area we've actually developed a, um, a logo and a statement for the officiating community 
So I'm really proud of that work, and you're going to see that being used a lot more. So if you have a look at the posters um, in, the, uh, in the area, and when Christina's around tomorrow, she'll be able to tell you about that. Um, so we will be, during the course of, of this year, launching that vision formally and some new IUA kit. The other thing that we've done over the period is to introduce the regional officiating coordinators, which are like mini Christinas around the world, um, not literally mini Christinas, um, but uh, one per region, one per region, um, and they are essential to the process of, of, of administering excuse me, the appointment of international umpires and the UAP for events, and they, they work with the um, international testing panel out, who are, oh, excuse me, the panel who are out there that actually test and train the umpires. And they are the administrators that actually make sure that the information about our officiating community comes into us through NetWorld, which is our absolutely wonderful um, online system for the management of appointment of umpires. And I really, Christina has done an exceptional job building that platform from scratch um, to make it work for us because it's a very challenging process. If you remember, some of the research results said there was concern around the transparency of appointments for international umpires. So we wanted to make sure that there was appropriate transparency of how the appointments were being made. So if you want to learn more about that, please talk to Christina. Um, it was a real effort to make sure that there is trust and respect both ways in terms of how appointments are made and, and why. So very a lot of work in, in that area. So on to our third pillar, empowering through netball. So the first part of our, the first goals on our empowering through netball um, pillar are around how we are perceived by our stakeholders. And this is a big one for me. So this is about to achieving recognition from our stakeholders that netball and the INF is a force for good. I mean, that's a pretty high goal. So how do we do that? Well, through market research. So we did a stakeholder survey in 2017 and the results of that are in both the um, annual reports because it's relevant. And I just picked off a few key messages so in that survey, which was um, both internal and external stakeholders, um, we have very high numbers in terms of certain areas. So going back to that clean sport image, when we measured it in 2017, uh, end of 2016, early 2017, 70% of the respondents believe INF is doing very well in relation to maintaining a clean sport. So inevitably, I'm going to measure that next year. So let's see whether we've improved. 80% associate netball with a positive social experience. I think that's a tick anyway, but if we can get even better responses, that's marvelous. 90% associate netball with positive role models. I mean, if that's not a fantastic response, I think we should be really proud of all of ourselves about how well respected our players and participants are. 81% believe netball creates a welcoming environment for all. That's a great, that's a great statistic. And 70% associate netball with accessibility for all. So I think that's a really good starting point, but let's see where we are next year. Next year. We'll try. Okay, second part of empowering with netball is actually about our effective communications. So effective, frequent and meaningful dialogue with all of our stakeholders so that we when we started and um, this was the early days with um, Nikki on board we had a we had a Twitter profile we have Facebook we have Instagram we were tiny and we've moved a long way I still think we're tiny I, I sit there looking at well I shouldn't look at football but if I benchmark myself against reasonable I believe we've still got a long way to go in terms of the engagement. We're not trying to we're not trying to get away from the membership engagement with, um, but we still have a voice to be heard out there. Not really for INF. I don't really worry about people thinking about INF, but this is about netball, global netball. So we try and we try and make sure that we are we are out there, and we've we've. Spent, we have very little money to spend, but we have spent quite a lot of money on our, on our digital communications, and we will continue to do so. 
So we have driven campaigns, talked about the Netball World Youth Cup campaign, talked about the Commonwealth Games campaign that Nikki ran, which was more of a PR campaign. So we have a campaign that runs alongside the event campaign for this week about what's going on in this room. So um, we, we, we're working on that, but it's a big area, and I think there's huge potential. So uh, Grace and Nikki, there's great, great things we can do in this, uh, in this area. And the final goal is around a netball world development program to, place, uh, to grow the membership uh, and build capacity throughout the regions. And quite frankly, this is the toughest one. And this is where we've, the one we found hardest. Um, it, our progress is just not good enough. So um, what we set out to do very naively in 2016 was to grow our membership to 100 members. Now, you should never put a number there if you don't have a plan to get there. What we realized when we actually looked at our membership is that we actually had to do work with our existing membership, hence all the work on the governance and making sure that we actually, the members that we had were actually um, in a good place, that they had the support they needed, that they had the governance in, uh, in place, that they were paying their fees, that they were in good standing with everything, that they had the support and they were actually healthy. So, all that, so our membership actually hasn't really grown in that period, but I hope you feel, um, I hope you feel, because we feel it, that, that there's been huge strides made in all of our membership. The fact that we have all these constitutional documents, the fact that we are going through. So I think we've improved the quality of our, of, of our netball organi global organisation, but we certainly haven't improved the numbers. And I really would like to engage a dialogue with the regional federations to say, what is a reasonable number that we should aspire to? Because I sit there in these international sports meetings and you get, you know, it's like, how many members have you got? And it's my sort of league table, if you like. And I have to kind of shut my eyes to that and say, it's quality that counts. So uh, I'm really proud of the quality of our membership and um, we'll worry about the, the numbers will flow as we grow this sport, as we get the visibility in the world. We've got a lot of countries interested in taking up netball because we're creating demand. So rather than rushing out actively, just playing a numbers game, um, I want people to rush to us to say we need to be a part of this sport. So. The Empowering with Netball, through Netball, our ambition has been always to raise money in this area so that we can actually fund the sort of programs that some of the other international federations can fund for development. And that's where our foundation will come in. And I'm not going to say anything more about it because you're going to hear an awful lot about this over the next couple of days. But just to say, we actually do need money to do stuff. and. Um, we can't rely on membership fees. It's just not enough. So I'm going to leave that there. We do what we can with the money we have. I'm really pleased that our coaching advisory panel have, have run an exceptional coaching conference in each, pretty much all of our regions now since they've been going. Those are the ones just in the last four years. And they have an elite coaching conference here in England. So if you want to see those world-class coaches in action, I, I, there are probably still spaces for that one. Um, they are a terrific resource for us. And, uh, and I, hope, I hope you make contact with them. If you ever want to get advice on coaching, if you're looking to employ coaches, get in touch with us and our coaching advisory panel may be able to put you in touch with coaches um, to come out and help work with you on your programs. So I better hurry up. Looking ahead, so Netball World Cup hat is going to be brilliant. Um, you'll see that over the course of the days. Um, World-class officiating vision, you're going to see evidence of that. So that's, you, I'm just getting you warmed up. Um, creating choices and the INF Foundation. We're just putting a few words out there. You're going to start hearing some of these words a bit more. Netball World Cup, oh, sorry, Netball World Youth Cup, regional qualifiers. We've already had one. Did anybody notice that? <laughs> it happened very early. It happened in Japan. Um, you didn't know we had events going, netball events going on in Japan. We have our first three qualifiers for the Netball World Youth Cup in um, Fiji for 2021. And uh, let me see if I can get this right. I'm doing this from, I'm not gonna mention it, I'll get it wrong. So you'll hear later today who the first three qualifiers are. I'll let the Netball World Youth Cup say who those are. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. So that's terrific news. Um, but very importantly, um, our Netball 2020 plan comes to its fruition. Um, so during the course of the rest of this year, following our elections, um, we will be gathering our new board together. We have a number of changes in the board that you'll know about through the course of this. So the new board takes over at the end of this championship. Their first board meeting will be uh, probably the last weekend in October and um, they will come together and the first thing they will be doing with us is reviewing how we've got on with the strategic plan and setting out the strategy for the next four year period so from 2020 onwards to 2024 and uh, so it's really important that you have an opportunity to shape their thinking which is why some of the some of the discussions and some of the items that are coming from members are really essential for us today to help share our work to help shape our strategy and our work program for the next four years. So if there is something you think we should be looking at, make sure we hear about it whilst you're here. It's the best opportunity. We're happy to set up meetings individually with you if there's something you'd like to do with the new board, we'll do that. We'll facilitate that. Come to the workshops. The workshops, we've got some very meaty, very substantive to topics to go through. And that's your opportunity to come in and help shape the future of your sport. So I'm gonna finish there. Um, I'm gonna hand you over and you can see the financial prospects, but I'd just like to say thank you very much again for your attention. I know sometimes going through reporting can be a bit dull, but um, hopefully you got something out of that. Thank you.